Good morning to the plenary roundtable welcome. Um, I, I was really moved by Professor Jetto's uh, introduction uh, keynote speech just now. And it's actually a perfect introduction into this session. Um, I'll still give you a few of my observations, but she said it's so much better. Um, so thank you very much for that. I don't know if you're still here. Are you still here? Great. Glad you could stay. Wonderful. Um, so I, I would like to introduce this session by a few observations um, on implicit bias. Um, and of course that was mentioned by Professor Chetto uh, very eloquently. Um, we all know it still exists against women in academia and it results in women still considered less competent science leaders and it hinders them as we all know, we see so clearly at this conference in every step of their career. But I think similar implicit bias exists with respect to the content of research, where it still appears far too often that explicitly including women in the research questions, design and analysis somehow makes the research less important, makes it less hard and less deserving of our attention and our money. Well, we all know it's short-sighted and quality lowering and just plain bad academic business to not have gender balance in the research and in the research staff just as much as in the research questions. It's, it's really foolish to frame our research questions with just the male model in mind, design our research just thinking about men, analyze our data and implement our results just caring about half the population. So the new large research program, such as the EU 70 billion horizon 2020 program that was discussed yesterday, they rightfully focus on global challenges. And all this research is necessarily multidisciplinary. And I think we can all agree that the EU 70 billion will not be spent well if gender is not an integral element if we don't include women in the research questions, design and analysis, and if we don't see them as crucial parties in the implementation of our results. If we don't do that, we do a huge disservice, not just to half of the world's population, but to the whole population of the world, women, men and children alike. So today in this plenary workshop, you'll hear about the importance of the gender dimension in the global challenges from eminent speakers from the US, Europe and Mexico, and you see them right behind me. Um, but we're going to start with a video from a speaker who couldn't be here, uh, Dr. Subra Suresh. Um, and he's going to tell us what he would have told us had he been able to be here. I'm multitasking, it's not going very well. Here we are. Um, and he is now president of the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, but until July, just recently, July 2013, he was director of the NSF. And before joining the NSF, he served as the dean of the School of Engineering and a professor of engineering at MIT. And in his video, he will speak about his effort to create the Global Research Council. Could the video be started, please? There's someone in the back, I think, who's going to do that for us. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the North American Gender Summit. I'm sorry for not being able to attend the summit in person, but I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to provide brief remarks through this video message. A little more than two years ago, the National Science Foundation launched its Career Life Balance Initiative at the White House. It was my privilege as the director of NSF at that time to join First Lady Michelle Obama and a number of leaders from the nation's capital at the White House event. This is what I said during the launch of the NSF Career Life Balance Initiative on the 26th of September, 2011. We need strategies that broaden the participation of those who are underrepresented, especially in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM. These strategies to tap the historically underrepresented talent of women, minorities, and persons with disabilities are essential to our future innovation, economic prosperity, and global leadership. Today's announcements represent one such strategy. NSF cannot do this alone. Given its pivotal role as a major funder of the nation's fundamental scientific enterprise, 
NSF bears responsibility to help workplaces creatively enable scientists and engineers to meet career and family demands. As women weigh career aspirations against conflicting life events, such as the birth or adoption of a child, duties of raising children and providing elder care, family-friendly policies help prevent them from being forced to make difficult decisions. They should not have to choose between their baby and the lab bench. <clears throat> Family formation, notably marriage and childbirth, accounts for the major loss of female talent from the job pool between the receipt of a PhD and achievement of a tenured position in the sciences. The statistics are overwhelming. Women account for about 41% of all new PhDs in science and engineering, but their share of full-time tenured or tenured track positions in academia is only about 28%. Diversity in education and in the workplace, whether arising from diversity in gender, race, ethnicity, national origin, or other life circumstances, accelerates innovation. This is because different people with different life experiences view the same issue from different vantage points and often correct one another's hidden biases. I have found this to be true in my own research work involving diverse teams of students, postdocs, and collaborators. It is clear that diversity fostered by global collaborations is also increasingly becoming the norm in scientific and engineering research today. Yet, there is a mismatch between the input to the scientific enterprise and its output. Funding, whether public or private, is the catalyst for the scientific enterprise. And it is necessarily dictated by local policies and practices. However, the output of this investment, which is new knowledge created by the scientific enterprise, is global, and increasingly, it has no national borders. Given this mismatch, it is only natural to ask the following questions. How does each nation nurture its local priorities while engaging successfully in a highly competitive yet collaborative global enterprise? What are the principles of engagement in this global research and knowledge enterprise? How are these principles collectively developed and endorsed, especially to benefit those from developing countries who are entering the scientific enterprise? With these questions in mind, the Global Research Council was established at the National Science Foundation in May 2012 at the first ever gathering of the heads of research funding organizations from nearly 50 countries. This virtual organization is engaged in developing principles for collective engagement with respect to scientific merit review, research integrity, pathways for open access to publications and data, and mobility of researchers. In May 2013, heads of funding organizations from more than 60 countries gathered in Berlin, jointly hosted by Germany and Brazil. Nearly 100 countries, including two dozen organizations from sub-Saharan Africa, participated in the regional meetings of the GRC last year. Next year, the GRC meeting will be held in Beijing, jointly hosted by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Natural Science Foundation of China, and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. The topics to be addressed will include open access to publications and mobility of researchers, along with discussion of strategic planning for collective action for the next several years. Soon after the founding of the GRC, I was asked to provide a simple statement for the vision of GRC. This was my statement then, and I still believe that it captures the spirit of GRC. Good science anywhere 
is good for science everywhere. Thank you. That was very well put, and I think it's a wonderful step up to the first uh, speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Teresa stanek Ria. She is the Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Deputy Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Very important woman. In this role, she provides leadership and oversight to one of the largest intellectual property offices in the world and she has served as Deputy Undersecretary and Deputy Director since March 2011. And today she will speak about the Patents for Humanity, USPTO's voluntary pilot program to recognize patent owners who apply their patent and technology to address humanitarian needs. Dr. Stanagria, can I ask you to come forward? Do you have a PowerPoint? No. Great, go ahead. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not a morning person, but the fact that you all got here earlier than me and you're all awake, I am impressed. So it has changed my attitude completely. <clears throat> all right, first of all, I want to thank Drs. Wanda Ward and Graham Harrison from the National Science Foundation for inviting me to um, present. I also want to thank Simone for chairing the session, and I have been looking forward to coming here today, and I am actually thrilled to be with my co-panelists, Janet and Amanda. And that was actually a very powerful video before I uh, spoke, so <clears throat> I was quite impressed. Sorry, um, I, you know, this weather sometimes kind of bothers me. So today I'm going to be speaking about the Patents for Humanity program, but I am going to sneak in quite a few remarks about STEM, because when I talk about STEM, it's probably when I'm the most passionate. And at the USPTO, we do a great deal of work to try and empower young people, and frankly, especially the underserved populations, and in this case, especially women, to actually take more and more math and science classes. So before I get into that, um, I want to tell you that <clears throat> at the USPTO, 36% of our workforce is female. Now think about it. We have, we have 11,800 employees at the US Patent and Trademark Office, 8,000 patent examiners that all have undergrad or graduate science degrees. They're either engineers, chemists, or other related um, science fields. So 36% of our workforce is female. That is already very, very impressive. 44% of all of our managers and officials at the USPTO are women, so we're starting to bring them up to the top. 32% of our senior executives are women. So our statistics are pretty good. And I have to tell you that right now, I'm the top of the US Patent and Trademark Office, and under me are a number of business units. My two most important business units <clears throat> as patents and trademarks, and the Commissioner of Patents is a female, Peggy Focarino. The Commissioner for Trademarks is a female, Debbie Cohen, and the head of my International Affairs Division, which it's very important right now with patents and intellectual property to collaborate with other countries throughout the world, once again, Shira Perlmutter, another female. Now, Shira's brother, <clears throat> is actually Saul Perlmutter at Berkeley, and he has got a, um, a Nobel Prize in physics, and he's the one who figured out that the universe is actually exploding and not imploding. So to those of you who watch Big Bang Theory on TV, his name is mentioned in three episodes. <clears throat> So it's kind of cool. So while she is actually a copyright expert, I figure she had it in her DNA and she could have been a scientist if she wanted to. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Patents for Humanity program, but I guess before I do that, I should tell you why I'm so passionate with STEM. I myself have a degree in pharmacy, and of course I went to law school, and since 1980 I've been practicing intellectual property. <clears throat> So I've actually learned a lot of cutting edge technology through working on patent applications and issues with my clients. And I think science is totally cool. I have three children, and when my children were growing up, they had a babysitter. Since I have three daughters, the babysitters tended to always be females. And I'd say to the babysitter, so, what do you, because they're in high school. <clears throat> 
what are you going to do when you go to college? What do you think your major will be? Not a single one of the babysitters my children ever had had any interest in math or science. And they tended to be very smart people, females taking AP advanced placement and IB international baccalaureate classes. And none of them had any interest in science. Why? I don't know. But a couple of them explained to me, well, I got a B in chemistry or a B in biology. And because of that, they feel like they're a failure, so they're going to go into history and English. And I'm thinking, I got a B in chemistry in high school. I mean, and I got a degree in pharmacy. I had essentially five years of chemistry, and I felt like I was very well prepared. You know, the grade isn't what really counts, but I think we do something in our education system that somehow tells females in particular, and minorities, frankly, that you can't do it, and they just accept that message. I'm sure I got that message, but I was a natural blonde back then, I tell people, and I totally missed it. My dad was a, chem was a, was a mechanical engineer, and the only homework he could help me with was math and science. And I knew I was smarter than my dad. So therefore, <laughs> anybody who taught me, I figured, no, I can do this, I can do this. And getting B's was totally fine. So now when I talk to young, peop young women in particular who come by the patent office, I tell them, so what kind of grades do you get? Get the best possible grades, and a B is good enough in science. I mean, I tell them that again and again. Why they think you have to get all A's just amazes me. I, I really can't think of any time I got all A's, um, and I don't like to tell too many people that. But there, there are, <laughs> but this is a close group and nobody will tattle, right? Um, but, but we've got to get the word out that you don't need, what you have to have is a passion or an interest in science. And actually it's a lot cooler than most of them think. You can tell stories in history, stories in English. It's harder to tell a story perhaps in science, but not really because if you get me going, I could give you just as many and the best stories in science and the best stories in science discovery that frankly, I apologize to history majors, it's way better than any history story that you could give. But at any rate, so that's just what I wanted to tell you. I have three daughters, all three are engineers, two chemical engineers and one biomedical engineer. So somehow, you know, usually if a parent wants to tell the child what to do, you can't tell them what to do. So I never push them into it. I let them do whatever they wanted to do and it sort of fell out and worked out. Because my mother wanted me to be a physician, my dad wanted me to be a chemical engineer, I didn't listen to either one of them, I became a pharmacist. So I knew you cannot tell children what to do. But I think they could feel my passion for science and education, and we need more teachers, yes, who are smart, yes, who can teach, but who have a passion for what they do, and they can bring that out with each and every one of their students. So let me tell you now about our Patents for Humanity program at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, President Obama announced that program in February of 2012, and it was actually designed to um, solve long-standing challenges in the developing world. When people think of patents, they think, oh, if something's covered by a patent, it makes the product more expensive. That is not necessarily the case, but I don't have the opportunity to give you an economic analysis right now. But we wanted to show that there's patents, people apply for patents in areas where they will never recover any money. And and in a way, getting a patent, it's a way of getting respect for their technology and their invention. They place that information in the public, in the public domain, so that other people can see what they do and ideally invent something around it that's even better. And it's all about improving quality of lives for everybody on this planet. So the Patents for Humanity program was actually a competition it recognized patent owners and licensees even who bring affordable, scalable, sustainable, and life-saving technologies to underserved regions of the world. And it provides business incentives for doing social good. Because what we gave with an award, we give people an opportunity to expedite some of their other patents through the US Patent and Trademark Office. And you can pay for expedited review but to the winners of this program, they could use this chit or this opportunity and expedite one of their other patent applications where perhaps they will 
recoup a significant financial benefit. But most of these inventions and patents for humanity are really designed for the developing world and people don't do it just to become rich or to make money. They make a little bit of money, but it goes into further research and development. So it's, we wanted to provide a real financial return for socially conscious actions. And the pilot program went from February of 2012 to April of 2013. There were five categories for our patent applicants, medicines and vaccines, devices and diagnostics, nutrition, clean technology, and of course, information technology, which is something the developing world needs as well as everybody on this planet. So anybody who could provide better education and living standards and could provide a benefit could qualify for the program. We actually received more than 80 submissions and they came from a wide variety of patent applicants. They came from Fortune 500 companies, small and mid-sized companies, as well as startups, universities, nonprofits also, and individual inventors. And we view that as evidence that many patent owners actually care deeply about improving lives of everyone around the world. But it wasn't just the quantity of the applications that impressed us, it was also the quality of the technology, the quality of the inventions. Um, it was far greater than what we would have imagined, and um, our stakeholders actually um, were evaluated by some very talented judges who I will identify and tell you a bit more about later, but they were evaluated on the effectiveness of their technology at addressing a humanitarian issue and the applicant's contribution to increase the use of technology among the impoverished and the impact those contributions have been made to improve lives. So we got volunteer reviewers primarily from academia because we wanted somebody who is as neutral as possible with an expertise in relevant fields and in particular our reviewers had expertise in medicine, science, engineering, law, business and public policy. And they recommended the winners to us and we presented 10 awards in a very cool ceremony on Capitol Hill where quite a few congressmen attended and spoke and it was a really good event. Now the winners ended up being three Fortune 500 companies, two mid-sized companies, and three very, very small companies that were essentially startups that were created in the last five years. So you can see we ended up having a very diverse group of winners also, and we were pleased with that. And then they had a wide range of humanitarian issues. And I'm just gonna zip through, a f I have a list of 10, I don't know if I'll zip through them all, but I'll zip through them just to give you a feel for the types of technologies and inventions that um, actually improve lives. You're not gonna be surprised by any of them. One of them, Gilead Sciences, got an award for making HIV drugs available to the world's poor using a network of generic manufacturers in Asia and Africa. So you have Gilead Sciences that came up with an AIDS drug, but of course it's a little bit expensive. They decided if they could make it through other smaller manufacturing companies in Asia and Africa, that it could be sold and provided to people at a much lower cost. It was a very creative way to sort of distribute and access Access to medicine is obviously something that's extremely important. The University of California, Berkeley developed an R&D uh, research and licensing agreements. Once again, it's a distribution network to provide a lower cost, more reliable way to produce anti-malarial compounds. Sign Fracture Care International distributed um, low-cost fracture implants to speed healing in developing world hospitals. Becton Dickinson created a fast, accurate TB or tuberculosis diagnosis device and placed 300 systems in 22 high-burden countries, 22 countries with a high prevalence of TB. DuPont Pioneer developed an improved strain of sour gum 
that was fortified with protein and vitamins for use in sub-Saharan Africa. Intermark Partners Strategic Management um, extracted edible protein and vitamins from waste rice bran in Latin America. So they took a waste product and they pulled out vitamins and nutrients that could be given to the local population. Procter & Gamble distributed a small chemical packet which improves, um, which actually removes impurities and contaminants from drinking water and it has purified nearly 5 billion liters worldwide. I forgot what the specifics were but it's just a little tiny packet. You put it in 5 gallons of water and I think within five minutes that water is sterilized. It is incredible. They actually sell it in this country for people who go camping and uh, don't have access to water. So they actually make a little bit of money but then they put it right back into R&D. Nokiro delivered solar light bulbs and phone chargers for off-grid villages and distributed them through local entrepreneurs. A big part of working with lesser developed countries is the distribution systems are just not there. Oftentimes the roads aren't there, the trucks aren't there, the drivers aren't there. So if you come up with a great idea, a great invention, unless you can get it to the people who need it, it's not going to be appreciated. Um, another one is Sproxel developed a system to identify counterfeit drugs with an ordinary cell phone in sub-Saharan Africa. In certain areas of sub-Saharan Africa, over half the drugs and medications sold there are um, uh, counterfeit drugs and so they usually don't have the active ingredient or they have the wrong active ingredient in it and they're actually unhealthy for the patients. So once again, their distribution system, their distribution chain has a problem or issue and they came up with a, me a way where you can identify whether something is a counterfeit drug or not and if it's the real thing that you're paying for and getting. And Microsoft actually provided machine learning tools that allowed health researchers to better analyze large data sets. That that's extremely important because the needs of developing countries and what they're exposed to in the environment is different from here. So the data that we're getting there, we want people to look at that data, pull that data, and identify drugs, medications, and ways to actually target and help specifically that population. The need might not exist in the developed countries, so you want people to look at that data, the information currently available, and help use it in a beneficial way. So at any rate, it, this was groundbreaking, it improved everything everybody's lives. Um, I think overall, and a lot of these inventions like the light bulb and the water sanitation packet actually are for sale in this country and I actually finally found somewhere I could get both of them. So they're actually very neat technologies. Now empowering women and improving efficiency for their work is crucial for reducing poverty and that was determined by um, a very uh, prestigious 20, 2010 report on how technology can advance women economically, which was published by the International Center for Research on Women. Now, I don't have to go through this, but countries who actually have less inequality, actually the children benefit and society benefits. So to make women on a par with men, both with education and opportunities, um, long term and short term, the entire society benefits. Um, I'm really big on trying to make education available to everyone. I tell everyone they should go to college, not for the right reason, but because it is the most fun time of your life, and I tell people the truth. Um, it's when you get exposed to a lot of things, and you should actually be expanding what you're thinking. So if you go into college thinking you're going to have one major or degree, remain objective and open-minded and listen to what everybody else does. So education is extremely important. Um, and we think that programs like the Patents for Humanity program is very, very important because what we do in one country benefits the entire planet, benefits everyone everywhere. Um, I don't have time to go into any more of our initiatives right now, um, but our K through 12 outreach at the USPTO is phenomenal. We obviously have a lot of people with science degrees, our patent examiners. They do things like going to basic um, science fairs and become the science fair judges and sponsor students and then they go we, and then all the way up um, we actually have we worked with NBC Learn and our on our video there's videos that you can actually download and look at on our website 
www.uspto.gov, and those are really cool. To re we want children to look at the videos to see what science and technology does to actually get them intrigued. And once again, it all comes back to stories. I happen to like the science stories. Um, um, but, but at any rate, so we do a lot of things at the USPTO. We do a lot of outreach at our Detroit satellite office. We're about to off open some satellite offices in, um, in Silicon Valley, in Dallas, Fort Worth, and in Denver. And then we're also going to do outreach in hubs there as much as possible. We team with museums. We team with the National Inventors Hall of Fame or Invent Now. And so we collaborate with as many people as possible. And late next year, late 2014, you know that big red building on the mall, the Smithsonian Museum, that's empty for now? That used to be called the Innovation um, Museum. And what it did is it housed the exhibition of um, 1876. It was like the, centen the centennial of this country. And I looked, I happened to go through there, I think, in 1984 or something like that. And it closed about 10 years ago. Where they're, where they're going to open it up next year. We're co-branding it with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and it's going to be a museum for innovation and technology. And it is going to be awesomely cool. Um, and we wanted it to appeal to the young, so we'll have people with smartphones, and they can go up to exhibit exhibits. We're going to have um, a little bit of art, so it's going to be more steam even. There'll be people doing art and sculpture right there. So the art is also a very important part of science, technology, engineering, and math. I am down to seven seconds. So we do a lot at the US Patent and Trademark Office. We're not all boring scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for this very inspiring presentation. Are you going to be around for the coffee break and later? Great, so people can come up to you if they, if they have ideas. Um, so now with the eye on the time also, I'm going to go to the next speaker, Dr. Janet Stotsky. Stotsky, did I pronounce that right? Thank you. Um, she's an economist and expert on gender budgeting and currently serving as an advisor in the Office of Budget and Planning of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And she contributed to an overview article, which you all may want to read, it sounds fascinating, to a special issue of the IMF's Finance and Development magazine on women at work, which analyzes various aspects of women's work experience and the gains that women have made in equalizing job opportunities and leadership roles, but also the challenges they still face to achieve real equality, and there are many of those. So Dr. Stotsky will speak about reducing gender disparities through gender budgeting, which involves systematic examination of budget programs and policies for their impact on women. So without further ado, I'd like to, for you to come forward and tell us about this program. Let's see if we can make this work. It should be, let's see. Where is it? It should be right here, but I don't know whether it is. Gender budgeting, it's the middle one. That one. Okay, yeah, we can close the uh, sidebar. Yeah. And how do I move it forward? Just here? Yep. Okay. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today as a social scientist and a distinguished audience of STEM professionals. I don't often get this opportunity. And following our previous speaker, I have a personal confession to make that I actually started in college as an engineering major, but freshman physics lab convinced me my comparative advantage was in economics. So today I'm going to present to you gender budgeting from the perspective of economics, but you'll see that it relates very well to the topics that have already been raised earlier in this session and the overall themes of the conference. In particular, I'd like to highlight the idea that Whoever controls the budget controls the agenda. So understanding budgeting is very important. 
but also that this concept has been very widely applied in the developing world. And echoing the themes of our previous two speakers in the panel, you'll see that this is a, a very important concept that, that deserves further application in, in this part of, of the world. So I'd like to start by just highlighting a few facts about gender inequalities, which I'm sure many of you are aware of in a personal sense, but also uh, from your own research, that there continue to be very significant gaps between men and women in, with regard to economic and social indicators. The World Economic Forum presents something called the Global Gender Index, and they indicate in their most recent study that 88% of 111 countries studied or covered by the index have closed gender gaps in recent years. So that's a great step forward and shows that progress is being made. Nonetheless, these gaps remain very large, and especially in parts of the developing world, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East and North Africa, and South Asia. Some of the countries that have done the best are in Scandinavia, where they've closed most of the gap, and you can see that even from the, the share of political representation that women hold in those countries. Some countries still lag. As, as we can see, the lowest ranked country was Yemen, a country that has suffered from a great deal of civil conflict, but also very entrenched uh, biases towards women's participation in, in life. In the area of education, women have come the furthest in narrowing gaps. So now, in many countries in the world, especially in the developed countries and even some emerging countries, we see that women now attend tertiary education at a higher rate than men, something we, we can observe in our own country here. I teach uh, as an adjunct at American University. I think the ratio is now something like 60% women and 40% men. And this is a trend that is being seen throughout the world. But nonetheless, in, in secondary and tertiary education in developing countries, you still see significant lags in women's participation. So this is an area where we need to do more to encourage women. And in particular, you will see that discrepancy largest in the areas of science, technology, and mathematics, and even in economics, although we're a social science. We still have a significant gap between women and men's participation. In the area of health, women have narrowed gaps, but we still see maternal mortality remaining very high, too high, and in fact, if some of you are familiar, familiar with the Millennium Development Goals, we'll see that some of these benchmarks are going to be missed, and this would be one of them. There are still what we call missing women. If any of you are familiar with the, the study of missing women, it's that there are fewer women in some countries than bi biological norms would suggest, and there are a variety of reasons that include selective feeding of children so that girls die at a higher rate, selective treatment of their diseases because the, the boys in the household are valued, and even, unfortunately, in many countries today, uh, disc discrepancies in the rate of abortion where many female fetus fetuses are aborted because the family prefers to have a boy, especially if there's limits on the size of their family. If we look at the issue of poverty, we have seen that poverty has declined in relative terms throughout most of the world. That's a great achievement of economics and other parts of uh, the world community who work for this goal, including the IMF where I work and the World Bank and other international financial organizations. But if we look at where poverty remains most concentrated, it remains among women and female-headed households in particular. We can see that women are still discriminated against in the legislation of many countries, especially with regard to tax and financial legislation. This is where I first became interested in the issue of gender gaps, looking at the tax, that the bias against women, the outright discrimination in the tax codes of many countries. At one time, this was the case in, in the developed world. The British tax code had built-in biases against women, which was then spread throughout the Commonwealth in their colonial domain. And in many of those countries, that discrimination remains the case, even though the British eventually revised their tax code to re remove this discrimination, and only fairly recently, not, not too long ago. We also see that women have lower access to land and credit, which makes it very hard for them to, to develop businesses, because in having some form of collateral is very important to get loans, as you all probably know. And in the developing world, this is an especial challenge. Women's labor force participation is still hampered in many parts of the world, including for educated women. And you can see in parts of the world, their participation remains well below 50%. This was the topic of the special issue that, that was mentioned, the women at work, which um, we had sent some to be distributed, but if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to send them a the copy of this issue um, after the conference if they'd like to read the entire edition. 
Occupational segregation is prevalent and gender-related wage gaps are pervasive all over the world, including still in the United States, where they have remained stubborn. I remember one of the professors at Stanford, where I went to graduate school, telling me that it was biblically ordained that women would earn 67% of men. So. I'm glad to see that he's still around, emeritus now, and, and the gap is now about, only, women have now closed the gap to about 80% of men, so it doesn't seem to have been biblically ordained. Women also perform the bulk of unpaid labor. As we all know, even when women work, they still perform most of the work in the home, and, and this is an especial burden in the developing world where women don't have the kind of access to all of the appliances and other things that women here have, but women can also make use of cheaper labor to help them, so there are some offsets there. So what is gender budgeting? I know I'm going to run out of time, so I'll try to go through the, the economic issues a bit quickly. It, re it refers to the systematic examination of budget programs and policies for their impact on women, and it's gained significant impetus in recent years, especially following the, wor the Fourth World Congress on Women in 1995. So the idea of gender budgeting is basically to look at how the budget, which controls the agenda, as I said, impacts women, and how you can address gender gaps by building into programs things that will look, focus on where those gaps are and how they can be most effectively addressed. And why do we justify this? Well, there are various reasons, as, as our previous speaker spoke, that reducing the disadvantaged status of women can lead to benefits for everyone, not just women and girls, but for men as well, the whole world. In fact, there's a considerable body of research in economics that suggests that, that reducing gender gaps leads to faster growth, and this makes everyone better off. And it also can lead to greater economic stability, which is a concern because variations in the economy can lead to a lower growth rate over time as you go from boom to bust, and sometimes, as we know in, in the case of the developed world at the moment, you can end up in a sustained bust, and it can be very hard to get out of it once you have a boom that crashes, as we did in, nine, in 2008. So this is a concept from economics called externalities. It's a spillover, something that is incidental and not fully taken into account by the market. So we would say that gender inequality creates a positive externality, something that the private individual trying to decide whether to do a program of this or that might not take into account because there are benefits that go beyond the immediate audience targeted to that program. So if we're reducing a gender gap increases global growth, that's a notion of a positive externality, and this justifies government intervention to try to generate more of that good thing that cr creates that positive externality. There's a whole theory in economics that looked like this, looks at this issue. Uh, you, some of you might be familiar with the work of the Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Coes, at the University of Chicago, who, who developed these ideas, but it goes back over 100 years to the, the notions of the great British economists at the time, who looked at the idea that markets can fail. They don't always in incorporate everything that's good, or it could be also things that are bad, like pollution, but that this justifies government intervention. And this is the main argument for gender budgeting. Not that we want to impose things on the, the unsuspecting populace, but because it actually is good economics. And I think sometimes this argument gets lost in this discussion, that it's actually good economics to do gender budgeting. So how can you incorporate gender budgeting into a budget? Well, one way is through the composition or level of spending, and that's usually the focus of studies that look at gender budgeting. How you look at programs from the point of view of whether they can reduce the gaps, whether you're targeting the right kind of spending, things like equalizing education, are you providing the right kind of facilities for women? I've been recently working on African countries, and it was really stunning to me as an American to discover that many girls in African countries drop out of school at the time they begin menstruating because there are no decent bathrooms and there's no way for them to keep themselves clean. So it's shocking to me to even think about that, but for many countries, being able to invest in the money to provide running water and bathrooms for, for children so that girls can continue on and don't drop out at the age of 11 or 12 is really critical to keeping them in school. Nutrition programs, health care, all of the things that science can help to bring more cheaply to these countries are important ways to reduce gender gaps and make sure that the most deprived people in, in the deprived parts of the world can better themselves and their countries at the same time. 
For instance, in some countries, governments have tried providing a subsidy. It can be in the form of cash or in the form of food in some very poor countries to induce them to keep their daughters in school rather than keeping them home so that they can help with housework and other tasks like drawing water. Again, as an American, it's very shocking to me to discover that in many parts of the world, the girls are burdened with the task of providing water, clean water to the household because there's no running water and that they have to spend a good part of their time doing this. So the budget can be geared to investing in the kind of things that really focus on allowing girls to equalize their opportunities with boys, especially at the age when they're accumulating the human capital that they need to be productive citizens. And I tried to relate this to the concept of science and technology. As you can see, it does relate. And since governments uh, provide an important component of funding for science and technology, then they can gear their, their, uh, the money that they provide to these kind of programming, to programs, and also to bring in women's perspectives so that they ensure that the important things are really given uh, time and, and money. It could also relate to basic research as well as applications in both areas of science and technology. Now, some things only bear fruit over a longer period of time. So that's why in economics, in the area of budgeting, we like to look at medium-term budgeting. For instance, reducing fertility. This, this will be something that allows, let's say, improving a girl's education will reduce fertility, will have great benefits to their families. In some of the poorest countries of the world, you see that the fertility rate is very high and it's very difficult for families to raise the average human capital of their children simply because they have so many children. So this is something that will only bear fruit over time as that reduced fertility allows the children in that household to become more educated and benefit their societies. You might not see any benefit for 20 years as these children are getting educated, but over time it will have a significant impact on your society, something that, for instance, you can see in the enormously successful growth rates of the East Asian uh, countries, which did focus on this going back a generation and now are bearing fruit in terms of really raising the standard of their living at an enormously impressive rate. Similarly, efforts to reduce illiteracy will also bear fruit over on the longer term because, of course, it's much harder to, to reduce illiteracy among adults and particularly older people. But if you start with a generation of children who are well-educated, it will bear fruit over a longer period of time, not only in economics but also in the political sphere by bringing greater participatory action in, in bringing greater democratization. So as I mentioned, the, while we mostly focus on the spending side, the revenue side is also important. And as I mentioned, tax laws of many countries are, do have biases, but fortunately many of them are reducing those biases. And at some point I hope that we'll be able to say that, that this is gone. However, in the area of the financial sector, we still see significant discrimination against women, in particular their inability to get collateral to borrow and have credit and be able to start and build their own businesses. We should also look at the fees for public services as another area where we might want to think about setting those fees in such a way that we don't discourage both women and men from the basic services and up putting those fees at a higher rate on things that are less, less important and less critical, even though sometimes economic theory su suggests the opposite. We have to keep in mind the concept of externalities when we look at this issue. So a few examples of gender budgeting. You'll find there's maybe 50 or 60 countries in the world today that have some kind of notion of gender budgeting. Uh, the United States is not one. But you'll find this in Western Europe and throughout the developing world. Australia was, in fact, the first country to formally incorporate gender budgeting into its budget process. And the idea was for government ministries and departments to analyze the impact of their annual budget on women and girls. And they focused mainly on public expenditures. South Africa was another country in the post-apartheid era that worked worked very hard. It reduced discrimination, outright discrimination against married women in the tax code and created a level playing field. And it also focused in the gender budgeting initiatives on trying to emphasize in the budget of the country the priority of, of poor women because there's still, as you know, a very large gap between the well-to-do and the poor in, in South Africa. And it has an enormously high rate of female-headed households because of various reasons over time. And so you have a lot of entrenched poverty being among women. And so the gender budgeting initiative was designed to address this issue. 
India is a country today that has an active discussion of gender budgeting. I was contacted a few months ago by a journalist from an Indian newspaper who was trying to pressure the Indian government to actually make good on its commitments to incorporate gender budget seriously into its budgeting process. So it, it takes the form of a, a gender budget statement that accompanies the regular budget documents. And the idea is to try to incorporate programs into the Indian budget that would reduce some of the stark inequities between women and men that still exist in India. But it has been criticized as being too little and, and too slow for, for addressing the, the needs of, of Indian women and girls. Rwanda is an interesting example of a country that, uh, following the cataclysmic civil conflict it had in the 90s, tried to rebuild itself and move forward very fast to make up for what it had lost in that period and has brought gender budging very seriously into its budgeting process and also into its, and into its political process. It, Surprising you might hear, but it has one of the highest proportion of women legislatures in its parliament in the world today. And then the idea is to address issues that are very important in the specifically African context, in particular making sure that girls attend school at the same rate as, of, of boys. And I was interested in looking at their, uh, the details of this to see that they have focused specifically on increasing girls' enrollment in math and science, which is, is somewhat unusual to find in, in some of these countries' gender budgeting to focus on that. And, and as I mentioned, the lack of appropriate sanitation facilities for girls. Another area where they have focused on HIV AIDS, it would be surprising to some people to know, but maybe not to this audience, that, that in parts of the world HIV AIDS is actually more prevalent in women than, than men, a sad, a sad reality, and that women, girls start to become infected at very young ages for reasons which we all know would be beyond their control. So to sum up, women continue to be disadvantaged relative to men, but in many areas such as education, differences are narrative, narrowing. The economic justification for gender budgeting comes from the ocean of externalities or positive spillovers, as we call it, uh, from reducing gender inequities. This can have benefits not only to women and girls, but to the whole society, and in various parts of life, both economic and political. Bringing focus to gender inequities in fiscal policy is one way that the government can, can help to achieve progress. Public spending is a, certainly a, a key focus in many cases because the, the, this decides how the budget is spent and where to target, which, which government programs will benefit and would be most helpful in achieving this goal. But we shouldn't also neglect the revenue side. Because I'm running out of time, I just want to touch very quickly upon a second topic, which um, and I'll, I'll show you at the end, I wrote two papers on these two tops. I'd be happy to, they're, they're available on the IMF's website, but I'd be happy to, to assist anyone if they have an interest in following up. I see that the next session as well focuses in particular on the second topic, which is women and risk taking. So though that will be an interesting uh, follow up to this. But there are gender differences in behavior and if they're systematic enough, they have implications at the level of the macroeconomy. And because in the macroeconomic sense, consumption is the largest component of the macroeconomy, consumption behavior differences are critical to how the, the economy performs at a macroeconomic level. Similarly, because we can care at the macroeconomic level not about, only about the level of growth or the level of the economy, standard of living, but also the variability, the boom and bust, as I was mentioning, which can be very detrimental to sustaining growth, we also care about differences that may result from risk-taking, the, risk, the excess risk-taking in the financial area, for instance, which was the uh, most immediate cause of the crash in 2008 of the financial system and, and brought down the world economy with it. Differences also result from women's different attitude towards public choice and investments. Similarly, as noted in the, earlier, in the previous presentation on gender budgeting, labor markets, there are very stark differences still between men and women's participation. So uh, just to point to a couple of the most salient facts here, raising the share of spending over women, women have control benefits children and raises human capital. That's one of the earliest findings in the area of gender-based research in economics, that more of, from a microeconomic point of view, but it also appears to be true at a macroeconomic point of view, that women account for much of household spending, and as you give them greater empowerment in the household, they tend to spend money in ways that benefit the household and in particular their children by focusing on the human capital development of their children. That's not to say that men don't care about their children, it's just a tendency for women to spend the household money in a way that's more prudent and focused in this regard. 
So this can help both to generate faster growth and also stabilize spending because spending money on necessities tends to be more stable than money spent on frivolous things, as you probably know from your own budget. So this can create both the two benefits we look for, both greater growth and more stability. By having more women involved in higher paying occupations, such as the STEM fields, this will automatically generate a higher weight in terms of their control over household resources, simply because they say generate more of that income themselves. Also studies show that women have differences in risk aversion, and as I mentioned, since the next topic is on this, I won't focus on that, but it may lead to more stability. Public choice suggests that women care more about social insurance and redistributive program, which, depending on your political point of view, may or may not be good, something that, though, demonstrates something important to most people. And as I said, labor market. So to sum up, there are important differences in behavior, and we can see that this has effects at the uh, macro level and relates to the concept of gender budgeting because the government's budget is such an important part of our economies. Just a few of the references, um, some of the IMF work and then some of the working papers I myself contributed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stotsky, for an eye-opening presentation and a um, wonderful number of, of facts and data that we definitely have to go look into. Um, we're, we're short on time, so I'm going to introduce the next speaker to you. We'll probably end five minutes later, but we started five minutes later, so I hope you'll forgive all of us because I really want to give Dr. Galvez time to tell us about uh, her research and, and the diversity issues related to food security. Um, Dr. Galvez gained her PhD at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, specializing in food and biotechnology. And her current interests are molecular detection of genetic modifications in food. And she's been advisor to the National Committee for Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity, of the Secretariat of Environmental and National Resources, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on issues of biodiversity. And she will speak, as I just said, about diversity issues relevant to food security, nutrition, and gender. So please, Dr. Galvez, go ahead. Thank you. So how, how can we put this uh, on? A ver. And show, and show, and then we have to close this, I guess. It should be at the bottom, but we couldn't find it. Already. Yeah, it was, it's here. OK. Oh, there it is. Seems like yeah. this is it. Great. Enlarge it. Yeah. yeah, great, thanks. Well, it's great to be here before this big audience. And uh, I'm going to start talking about women in agriculture and nutritional knowledge because it is very much related and it is very important for our country, especially because uh, eating and eating conduct is uh, very complicated. And the role of women in the invention of agriculture is also very important for cultures and for development of humanity. And uh, women and agriculture today is also a very important issue. The role of women in eating and in nutrition in Mexico, well, we're going to see what's going on there, and obesity also. And we will talk a little bit about biotechnology. But um, Norberto Bobbio just once said that the best thermometer for measuring the degree of civilization in a population is the situation of their women. And according to this other author, women are historically the first economists because they have to provide resources, they have to ensure the coexistence of the, of the family, of the people that are around them. And uh, it, this is a total reference for the meaning, the real meaning of economy and feeding the family members is a key activity because uh, it is not an easy task because we have to consider several things when we're eating because it's not just a matter of hunger and society or appetite, it's a matter of knowledge. It's a matter of uh, traditional values, tastes, preferences, habits, manners, fashion, fears, whims, prejudices, uh, beliefs, emotions, memories, or simply your state of mind. So we eat in, with very bad, because of many different reasons. But in terms of metabolism, in order to obtain nutrients, we have to eat other species, eat other organisms, and to, we have to ingest the remains or we have to ingest their secretions. Well, I'm meaning milk, of course. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what we call food. And the digestion releases the compounds from this food matrix, 
And these compounds are, are absorbed in order to be utilized as nutrients. And diet is the, the, the term that gathers all these foods and beverages that are natural or processed or culinary or industrially, and that they, are, that they have to be consumed in one day. That is diet. And of course, there are physiological mechanisms of digestion, absorption, transport, and metabolism. All of them are nutrition, and a good nutrition is central to life and health. And going back in time, the role in, of uh, women in the invention of agriculture was key because they were the providers of nutrients. They had to collect and domesticate plants, and all this gave place to agriculture in the hands of women. Men were doing some other things. Collecting was based on a great diversity of plants, and they were tried little by little and the knowledge about their nutritional value or the toxicity or the taste had to be generated. And domestication was the great invention that permitted human settlements and changed nomad life. The consequences of agriculture were that diet, it was ensured in terms of availability, but diets became less varied, although they were highly available. And they provided safety to human populations that flourished and given place to, uh, they gave place to many cultures as we know. But today, modern agriculture, extensive agriculture, 90% of, of its operations are based on a few basic crops, actually five, rice, and in, term, in, in, um, in terms of the highest is uh, the most um, uh, produced is rice, then corn, wheat, soybean, and potatoes. So if we are going back also in time regarding the Mesoamerican culture, we had very important, very important settlements and very important cultures, and the culinary achievements were based on joining biodiversity with agricultural development for the efficient use of resources. And we had, in Mexico at least, uh, chinampas and milpas. These were the ancient ways of, of uh, planting and, and making these cultivations, and uh, chinampas are still there in Mexico City, believe it or not. In Mexico City, you can still see channels uh, or canals with water, and these floating islands where people uh, plant uh, and, and collect, and, and they plant maize, basically. And these were applied for the domestication of a great variety of species with a masterly sense of efficiency and use of resources. But what's going on with the women and agriculture today? In developing countries, according to FAO information, women produce between 60 to 80% of the food in developing countries, meaning that this is half of the world's production. So therefore, women are the main food producers. So they are responsible for processing and preserving foods on top of being in charge of feeding the family, taking care of the kids, and therefore, their nutritional status of the whole family. So however, women face tremendous barriers in order to carry away these tasks. Uh, due to men migration, basically in Mexico, it's, there's a big, big growing of participation of women still in agriculture labor force. So they are using, they are occupying now the men's jobs in agriculture as independent producers or workers or some family workers with salary or without it. And this feminization of agriculture started in the 60s in, in Latin America with a marked tendency of internal migration inside the country, exceeding sometimes men's, men migration. So in rural areas, when they are facing lack of food and services, women have to take responsibilities on top of family care, food preparation, and home chores even when total labor force decreased in all agricultural activities in the 90s because of highest, uh, higher technology, the rate of women's presence in the task force increased, especially in our countries, in developing countries. So, and they, they not only work in the fields and the pastures, they also work in processing plants, in food plants, in packaging plants. And of course, women's essential contribution to agriculture in developing countries is huge. It's 43%. Uh, that, that's a global average. In Latin America, it's less. It is 20%. But in Asia, it is 50%. And Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So depending on the crop, of course. But uh, we have um, 
the many problems, and uh, our previous speaker just talked about this. Women have no equal access to resources or to investments or services and opportunities in order to be more productive. So we have to deal uh, with land, with animals, with labor force, with education, with extension services and financial and technological services. All of that, women have to deal with that even though they have less, uh, less control over the land, for example, and ownership is uncertain still. And frequently they do not control the revenues that they obtain from the handling of small animals in the farms. The obstacles that are faced by women are interconnected and they have to be focused in a holistic manner because these obstacles make their yields less. And however, they are as good farmers as men are. But if women would have the same access to resources, they would be as productive as them. And the farm yields would increase and the calculations are that they might increase between 20 to 30%. Therefore, the agricultural production in those countries, in our countries, would increase just by making equality come true. And this is something very important because by that we could reach a reduction of 12 to 17 percent of the undernourished persons. So right now it's 925 million people who are undernourished. So this could be very important. And these direct enhancements in agricultural production just by closing the current gender gap would only be a part of the gain, uh, because by giving, giving women more resources, it has been proved that they will have, their voice in the family will be stronger, and the food security will be better, as well as nutrition and education for the kids. And better fed kids learn better and become productive citizens. And then the benefits would expand through generations. So gathering wood and bringing water should not be the only main chores of rural women. So we have to really think about facilitating these chores to them and offering them better services that would contribute to beneficiate them through an agricultural growth. And uh, there is not a single solution to this. It depends on each locality, on each place. Therefore, we need ad hoc policies and, we have to, and these policies have to be based on precise information, on very good analysis uh, of priority areas, such as eliminating by law all forms of women discrimination, or ensuring access to better resources, to education, to financial services and work. And uh, we would need, of course, investment on technologies for increasing their productivity and save them time in their chores, so they can dedicate to, to, to be dedicated to more important tasks so all these uh, issues are badly needed in our countries. We need to facilitate the participation of women in efficient work markets, more flexible and fair, fair for them, and listen to their voices for, in order to make good decisions. In uh, the Director General of FAO, FAO in, in 2011, it said something about that calculating the costs of gender inequality in agriculture would be able to provide important insights on how the policies and the programs could overcome these costs. We really must achieve gender equality and empower women just because it's, it is the right thing to do, but also because it makes economic sense. So just by simply thinking, thinking that, would be very important because women should be seen as equal partners for sustainable development and not only for justice but also for achieving this agricultural development and of course food security. In Mexico, by law today, women can be landowners, they can make decisions regarding their own activities in the field and many other spaces in daily life. However, inequalities still are affecting rural women mainly resulting in the following. Women remain as producers in family plots, small animal care, etc. but they should be able to work in new spaces in order to generate enhancement for the family or, or the family productive unit, the milpa, this is the, the family plot. Women employed in huge production units cannot take care of small children because they need daycare and they, never, they not always provide daycare for the kids of these migrant wor workers because uh, some of them, they just have to migrate in order to earn money, not precisely in agriculture. They go to factories and uh, places in the, in the border of Mexico, in the north border. 
However, there, there are a few examples of women organizations, like this case, in which there's uh, indigenous women are working and supporting each other in Quetzal and Puebla. But there is something that is not that nice in this picture. Just take a look, probably, you cannot see that very well, but you would take a look at the size of the women. They are fat. Uh, even though the Mexican cuisine is now recognized as a patrimony of humanity, and the traditional Mexican diet that was very mixed and varied, it, was, it, it, it is based in maize and beans and much more, because maize and bean is a very wise combination of cereal and a legume, and they are grown together in the plot, in the family milpa, and they are together in the metabolism, passing through the dish, or the, 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 the food that we prepare. Main, uh, maize is the main energy source. It gives fiber also plus the beans that give phytonutrients, and they give a moderate glycemic index. So this combination provides a very good complementation of, uh, of amino acids also on top of giving a moderate glycemic index. But we are not eating them anymore. Uh, the, the, the family plot would also give a great variety of vegetables and fruits, as well as a reasonable amount of proteins of animal origin, because there would be chicken and uh, hens there, so people could eat eggs or kill a chicken to eat. But this, there's something very important here. Uh, the family plot in Mexico, the diversity of the herbs, includes all these uh, weird names that I put down here. Quelites, quintoniles, verdolagas. These are the greens of the milpa that just grow spontaneously, most of these. Most of these are just growing there. But, but we also have zucchini flowers with la coche. This is a corn smut, a fungus that we eat also. And many more foods, all high in phytonutrients. And we are, I'm talking also about minerals, magnesium, selenium, zinc. So eating these this, uh, herbs, it's very important for nutrition. And of course, the role of women in nutrition cannot be ignored, and, but nutritional education is desperately needed because the size of these women is because they are abandoning the traditional diet. Because there's, well, of course, eating and the eating conduct is very complicated. And look at this, this is, uh, the, look at the red tags in the back of these zeppelins of these uh, soft drinks. This is, the, this is, this is uh, for one week. And of course, you can see also the, uh, the, the where is this? The, the beer of the dad, the dad's beer is there. Well, I don't know, I just lose the green thing. Uh, but look at the cheeks of the kid. He's chubby, you know? and the father is heavy. So uh, facing this uh, disproportionate changes in eating habits, as well as the rampant publicity, the role of tradition is very important. The role of tradition will protect people. So we have to come back and rescue these plants of course, with a modern view, we need to do something about it because this is a way to protect biodiversity and at the same time go back to eating the old ways. But we have to do something about it because we have to conserve and avoid this. We really need to avoid this. This is horrible. And uh, of course, biotech in this context, well, it is used in the north of Mexico in extensive agriculture because it is designed to do, to, to, to do that. But in, in many areas, for example, uh, GM cotton has been successful. It's been so successful that now it is not needed anymore because the, the, the pests are gone. They are wiped out. Um, in terms of soybean, uh, there's no native relatives of soybean. So in terms of uh, environment, there wouldn't be any introgression of the transgenes. Uh, however, the permits of soybean, of, of GM soybean in Mexico, in the southeast, in Yucatan, it is now threatening organic apiculture because the, the GM pollen is now uh, found in, in honey. And in, in Europe, the organic uh, labeling of this honey is now uh, ruined because of the finding of uh, GM pollen in them. So, um, of course, women are always performing experiments in their plots because that's why they managed to make the maize evolve in Mexico. And therefore, these uh, GM maize permits, they have to be reconsidered. They are now reconsidered because uh, it's, it's going to be crazy. There's lots of uh, maize pollen in this honey also. So this, this is some of the results that we're looking just right now in, in, in my lab. 
Uh, and men and women respect tradition and plant at least four native varieties because of the cardinal points. And different varieties will ensure that they, they will obtain something. And of course, the perception of biotechs um, in Mexico is not, it's not precisely a gender issue. It's more like a north-south issue. The north of Mexico will do it, and they would facilitate doing it, but not in the south. In the south, it is almost impossible. However, these experiments in the Milpas might have brought some of the presence of uh, transgenic maize in the south of Mexico because migrant workers just bring some grains in their pockets and they are going to test them and to try them in the, in the Milpas. So this is very little to, to talk about my country, but of course I have to give acknowledgments to all these people, to Luis Alberto Vargas and these guys that are uh, precisely the experts in uh, anthropology and, and economy, and uh, Edelmira Linares and Robert Bay, they are talking, they are uh, organizing the uh, farmers who keep these uh, greens of the milpa, they, uh, they have these networks of quelites, and of course, uh, they are and, and Hector Burges, of course, they're, they're, he's our main nutritionist, uh, very important person, and of course, thanks to my students and my, my people for, for the help and for you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Galvez, for this very inspiring talk, and it explains to us that it's so important to work together and to look at these issues on the, on the global scale. I'm afraid there is no time for questions or discussion, so if you have issues, and I'm sure you do, that you want to discuss with our speakers, please do so during the breaks, um, because we now have to go on to our next session, but I, I would like to wrap up um, both the, the keynote and the, the wonderful speeches that we just heard in this plenary session. What I thought of when I was listening to the speakers was this old Chinese proverb that I'm sure you all know, women hold up half the sky. Um, and I think in terms of their labor and the effort they put in, women hold up much more than half the sky on the global scale. And unfortunately, in terms of budget, access to resources, power and leadership, women hold up a lot less than, women get a lot less than half the sky. And this needs to change. And the word holistic has been mentioned a few times. I, I think we need a holistic approach. And we also need research. We need gendered innovations. But we also need gendered monitoring. Because if we don't look at women separately, if we don't realize their plight through research, we'll never be able to find the solutions. And I think this conference is a wonderful opportunity for researchers from all different areas, economics, medicine, social sciences, to realize this together and to look at women and, and diversity in a very holistic way. We need each other, we need to work together. And I think if we do, we can really make a huge change for women, for men and for children, for populations in this entire globe. So thank you very much for having been here this morning and listened to these wonderful presentations. I hope you're going to have a great rest of the day. And I think Wanda wants to say a few words now. And, to, and, and applause for the speakers.